I mentioned in the auditorium class this morning something I might refer to in my sermon and develop it just a little more. And so I'll use as the introductory part of this sermon that particular story. A couple of weeks ago thereabout, I was watching a certain show on business. And the person who was hosting that program had invited a man who taught at Harvard University. <clears throat> he taught business and various things connected with it. He had just written a book pertaining to ethical conduct in business. Now, there have been a number of those books and various articles along that line written, and many of them are quite good. Now, this fellow told a little story that I found rather interesting, and it can be certainly applied in a worthwhile way to those who are concerned about living like the Lord and His Word teaches us to live. When he was introduced, it was pointed out by the host of the program that he had had some serious health problems, although seeing him on the television screen, it didn't, you couldn't tell it. He had suffered a rather large or massive stroke he had had heart problems, and uh, he had some other serious problem that he had been dealing with. And so he asked him, how are you doing in all of this? And he explained, though again you couldn't tell it from his speaking, at least I couldn't, that he'd virtually lost all of his power of speech and had to relearn that. Once those matters were discussed, then the discussion turned to why he was a guest on the program in the first place. And it's because of this particular book. And then he began to tell something that I found quite unique in today's world. And you might realize also he, he was quite a scholar to have gone to Harvard and gone to Oxford and now teaching it at Harvard. Very pleasant man to listen to. But they were talking about the need for his book. And then he began to tell about something that he thought was the key reason a great many people, when they start out living on a high ethical plane, fall off of it and get into such a mess. He told about the time that he was playing basketball and had evidently was quite good at it in college. And he... They, the team, had gotten down to the point where they were going to be on up in whatever championship it was, and you know how they go through the various rounds of playing to get there. Then he paused and said, I made a promise to God as a very young person that I would not play any kind of games on Sunday. And I thought, well, that's really interesting to hear him. So that per that's what got my attention. So I want to hear more about what he had to say. He said then that he thought nothing about it. In fact, they were in England playing. Why they were there, I don't know what all it was. But as they played down to the various games and got down closer and closer to the championship, came time for the next game, and guess when it was scheduled? And he was one of their key players. And he said he thought about it and said, my conscience just said I can't do this. So he went to his coach, whom he admired very highly, and told him about his conscientious scruples on that matter and the promise that he had made himself. And you can see where we're going. We're talking about living up to, under any and all circumstances, what's right or wrong. We're not necessarily declaring what he said was right in every case. We're just simply saying... You know, all people everywhere have some sort of guideline, some sort of standard. And he's telling now why he wrote this book for people in business, this book on ethics. But here's the answer he got as to the advice uh, or the advice that he got from his coach. And the advice almost tells you what religion he is. When he said, well, yes, I've had those concerns too, but I decided I'd just go ahead and pray and then go to the priest and ask forgiveness later. Well, he said, being a young man and desirous of not letting the team down, we'd come so far, understanding my key position in that team, 
He said, I thought for a moment, okay, that sounds fine. So he said, I drove back to my room, and he said, I thought about it, even when I didn't fully realize and deliberately set my mind on it, it was still there. So he, he came in to his room, and he said, I guess all these years of what made me form such a view anyway all sort of came on all of a sudden. And he said, I can't do that. If I start it right here, there will be no end to compromise. Then he mentioned, I forgot how it came up, but it was in that very context that I think the, the, the person hosting the program actually led him to it. And he went to school with Jeff Skilling. Now, anybody know who Jeff Skilling is? Well, he's from Enron infamy. And he says, I knew him in school. I knew him when he was out of school. And he says, I think I can say that he never said, I am going to do these wicked things knowing they are wicked. And I don't care. He says, I think he did just what almost happened to me. This one time won't hurt, and I can correct it later. And it just built on more and more and more because it was so easy the first time when I gave up my convictions to justify my action. And then he said, I thought right then, I'm never going to do that. He got hold of his coach and said, I will not be playing on Sunday. Now, sometimes we think only very faithful members of the New Testament church have attitudes like that. But that's not necessarily so, although it may be very few and far between in this age, because some people's code of conduct is compromise every opportunity you can to let you do what you want to do. But now he dealt with something, and I recognized it, simply because of my study of God's infallible word and what it means to be convicted of truth and live consistently and steadfastly in harmony with that truth. And this is when he made this statement, and that's what I referred to in class. He said, I made up my mind a long time ago to do that, and I've never deviated from it. And once I got over that little hump in the road, it's never been a problem to me anymore. Anytime something came up that went against my scruples of what I understood was right and wrong, that would tempt me to do wrong, it never did anymore. I already knew what was right, and I did it no matter who was involved. Brethren, do you realize what a tremendous statement that is? and how it ought to be seen first, foremost, and always in Christians, members of the church. And that if you do ever say, well, it won't hurt to do it one time, you are opening a door. It's not just that you are sinning against God. You're opening a door and giving place to Satan, and you get closer and closer to him. Now, the Bible says, resist the devil, and then what? He will flee from you. Devil's a coward. He's a, he goes about as a roaring lion, Peter says, seeking whom he may to devour, but he's a coward. If you will face him as Jesus exemplified for us how to face him in uh, his temptation by the devil, and know the word of God well enough to answer him on every occasion with the love of God and the faith in God based upon his word, Romans 10, 17, then he will run from you because he knows that you're going to do what's right. Now, the Bible also says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw near or nigh to you. Well, how do you do that? Brethren, if it's not like this man did it, I don't know how to do it. It's seeking the authority of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in His last will and testament and always doing what He said. You may get tired of this, but I'll say it again. In the way He said it. And for the reason, sometimes there's been more reason than one that He said it. Fully obedient to His will. But if you ever decide, I'll just do it this one time. And take care of it, and then I'll go on down where I've been all along. You'll get to where you transgress more and more and more, and you're on the road to complete apostasy. No wonder the Bible says, and Jesus said it while he was in the earthly ministry, be not deceived. Well, be is a state of being. 
Not is don't be in that state of being. Deceived is believing a falsehood and persuading yourself that it's the truth. And that's believing a lie. And it's highly interesting to note that, our, uh, that Paul made it very clear that before there would be a great falling away, preceding, in other words, the ground being prepared for it, that people would have to enter into a state of simply not loving the truth. Listen to what he said to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 concerning people falling away. In verse 7, even while the New Testament is being written, he's writing part of it here. He says this, For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Even while the apostles walk this earth, and as Paul writes part of it right here, the New Testament's being recorded, how iniquity would affect the church was already at work. And the only thing, he says, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Brethren, when the apostles were alive on this earth, speaking in the place of Christ and having the powers the Holy Spirit gave them, any time a problem came up in the church, they could personally go deal with it. But that was only temporary. You remember what John said? When he points out that Diotrephes desires to have the preeminence among them and even cast out people that suits him and won't receive somebody that we send. You remember what John says about that? He says, when I come, I'll remember his deeds, which he maliciously does against us. What do you think that meant? He's going to just go visit there and say, I remember you, Diotrephes, how you're not obedient. Folks, he was telling them, I will exercise apostolic discipline on that man and straighten the whole show out. Do you see that again? Yes. You do when you see the closing parts of uh, 1 Corinthians epistle. Paul said, shall I come to you in a spirit of love or with a rod of discipline? What is he saying? Are you going to be persuaded by the truth that's refuted your false doctrine and showed you the way to go? Or am I going to have to come there and exercise apostolic authority to correct you? Well, now we've seen some of that apostolic authority. Paul struck a man blind one time because he was coming in between him and teaching a man the truth. And he called him a few appropriate names that perfectly described the reprobate. Now that gives us an insight into miraculous apostolic authority, but more than that, the discipline that existed while the apostles were on this earth. But we don't have that anymore. We have the apostles still teaching the same thing, in the Apostles' Doctrine, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And we know that that's the way things should be if we would be faithful. But you see, if we're faithful ourselves, then we individually apply these things to our daily walk with life. And we resist Satan with a thus saith the Lord, as it were, and we draw out of God by submitting to His authority always. Always. And we've got to have the disposition, not because it's just this man I heard, well, we got to have the disp I heard of it and heard, heard the uh, interview about, but we got to have the state of mind, in disposition, love of God, love of the truth, determination to do right no matter what that he had in saying, if it's right, I will never deviate from it because I opened the door for the devil to take up residence in my mind. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, it was Adam, the head of the human race, that the devil was after. And he got to Adam through Eve. But once Adam sinned, the door was swung right open for the devil to enter into this world and thus access every one of us. So it wasn't just a matter of Adam saying, oh, look what I've done personally. And it only affected me and Eve's sin affected her. He opened wide the door for the devil to come in this world. And all have sinned. Coming short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So there is never any room for any reason whatsoever to violate God's will, whether it's omitting what He obligates us to do in His Word or simply transgressing it. It's sin, and sin's the only thing to separate us from God. Jesus has solved the sin problem. 
He solved it because he was tempted at every point like as we are yet without sin. And thus, as the Lamb of God, he could go to the cross and offer his body on that cross a sacrifice for our sins. And he could shed his blood out of that body that knew no sin, though tempted in every point like, like as we are. And thus his blood could be shed for the remission of sins to all those that obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Five, in fact, add 8 and 9 to it. That's what it takes, and it never does change. Now let me show you something, and this will be the second part of this, because I want to go back to Genesis. The word Genesis meaning origin of things. After you have Adam and Eve <clears throat> in this world, in chapter 4, you'll see then in verse 1 that it tells about the birth of Cain, their first son. Then their second son, Abel. It tells you the kind of living that they made. Cain was basically a farmer and Abel a herdsman, a person who kept flocks. Now verse 3 covers a lot of time. How, how long? I don't know. But it says in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now where did they learn to make offerings to God? Well, I imagine they were taught by their father. They knew that was the form of worship under the patriarchal dispensation, and it continued to be the form of worship for 2,500 years until the law was given to the Jews, which then they approached God through the Levitical system. So they are worshiping, and in verse 4, Abel also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. So they both worshiped. Facts stand up to that. They both offered sacrifices. That means they gave up what they needed and it was important to them, but they gave it up to God. Well, then why does it say in verse 4 in the last part of it, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. In verse 5, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And notice, and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Well, we can understand from this very chapter what happened, but let's see how the Holy Spirit in writing the New Testament used this very thing to teach us about faithful obedience to His Word. In Hebrews chapter 11, that great hall of fame of great faithful people in the Old Testament, we see in verse 4, by faith, let's stop there, by faith, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. To do something then by faith, since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, meant they were complying with the will of heaven as it was revealed to them by the Word of God. That's how one does anything by faith. So by faith, Abel offered. By faith, Abel did something wasn't just a matter of saying, I believe Christ is the Son of God, and it's all there is to it. No, faith always moves you to do what God said do, in the way He said it, for the reason He said it. By faith, Abel offered unto God, there's the object of their worship, a sacrifice. But there's some modifiers before the word sacrifice, Hebrews 11, 4. It says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice, then came. Well, what made it more excellent? They both offered what they had, and they both sacrificed. They gave up things important to them, needful to them. Well, it means simply that Abel obeyed God in his offering, and Cain did not. And the Scripture goes ahead to say, concerning Abel, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. How can anybody today obtain witness within himself evidence in himself that he's righteous in the eyes of God. Do what the Bible says. Do just what Abel said or did. Act on the truth that is in God's Word. That's the only way it works. It can't work any other way. So notice that he was righteous. God testifying. God testifying of his gifts. Well, that tells me something. When I give my life a living sacrifice to God, which Paul says is my reasonable service, Romans 12, 1, 
then God is going to testify as it was in the teaching of the Bible. What? That I'm righteous. That's the only way I know how to know whether I'm righteous. Do you have any other way to know whether you're righteous or not? There's only one way. To examine yourself honestly and objectively in the light of the right and divided Word of God. Abel did that. Cain didn't. And so we raise the question, why then, knowing he wasn't doing what God commanded him to do, did he worship in the first place? Well, the only testimony that I think that uh, gives us concerning Cain is his disposition of heart. He had some way rationalized and thereby deceived himself that if I just worshiping, I can do what I need to do and God's going to accept it whether I keep what he said or not. Now you say, well, I don't think that. Well, then what do you think? <laughs> There's some reason the man worshiped but didn't worship according to the instructions of God. And the Bible's clear on it that Abel's sacrifice was more excellent and there was a reason it was more excellent. It was by faith. And faith comes from hearing the Word of God. Does this by the Word of God that he did what he did? That's how he worshiped God. But what if he had been like and maybe this tells the story about him. That is, Cain, one time, won't hurt. But it did. <laughs> and what impact did it have upon Cain when God himself pointed out that you were wrong? Well, come back up with me over to Genesis 4. Starting where we left off in verse 4 in the latter part of that verse, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And that's what the Holy Spirit, who was there when this happened and inspired Moses to write this account, when he inspired the writer of Hebrews to write it. What's time to him? But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Now what was the impact upon Cain? Cain was wroth. He was madder than a hornet. And no wonder his countenance fell. Now the Lord tries to reason with this fellow. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Make him think for a minute. Why are you in this state of mind that you're in? Why is thy countenance fallen? And then he tells him, which is still true to this day, If thou doest well, Shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door. Is that hard to understand? It also defines in service to God what is doing something well and when it's not well. Well is when by faith or by the Word of God, since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, we act. We do what God said do. That's doing well. You can't do any better than well as God defines the word well. How do you do better than well? You can't. That's all any of us ought to want to do is to do well as God defines well. And He defines it here as complying with His will and never deviating. Never saying, this one time to play on a certain day is all right. Or this one time won't hurt. Now, how mad was he? Well, he talked with his brother Abel. And it doesn't say what they talked about, but you can almost guess in view of why the fact that God said Cain was mad because his offering was not accepted. And he tells us that Abel's offering was accepted because it was well, it was by faith, it was as the Lord and His Word directed him. But they were in the field, and Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And in one way or the other, down through time, all the kings in this world, and they can be very religious, had tended to go the way Cain did here as to his disposition and action toward the brother who simply did what God told him to do. And then we have, of course, the whole story of what happened after that. But there's our point. There's our point. 
You cannot give place to sin any one time and think everything's all right. Now, through weakness and through ignorance, sometimes we stumble. But here is a case where they know exactly what God has said. And Cain does it, or rather Abel does it, and Cain doesn't. Well, why would he take it out on Abel? All Abel did was say, uh, speak, Lord, as it were, thy servant heareth command, and I'll obey, and he did it. And he selected by the Holy Spirit thousands of years later through the pen of the Hebrews writer as an example to all of us of faithful obedience to God and never deviating from it. Now, let me raise this question as we come toward the end. We hear, and I use a lot, the terms liberal and conservative. Every time that I use them, I define them because they are general terms. They can be used to mean various things by various people. I always point out that liberal means one who by his teaching looses people from what God in his word binds upon them. And by conservative, I mean those who conserve the authority of the scriptures and who comply with the mandates of the truth of God as set out in the scripture. I will go further and point out that you hear the term many times anti, and by that we simply mean those who bind no men what God did not obligate or bind upon them. I don't discuss pe with people those things unless they tell me what they mean by them. In logic, you can simply have what's called a verbal dispute, which means you've got the same terms, but one's defining it one way and one's defining it the other. How in the world can you ever discuss anything, arrive at anything, when one is saying one thing and meaning it this way with this term, and you're saying something completely different when you use the same term over here? That's the reason you define your terms. That's how you understand that you're all on the same line on the matter. And so it is that I focus on the word liberal, where people, by their doctrines, by what they teach, and even by the example they set, loose people from what God in His rightly divided word bind upon them. Now, sometimes people think, unless you've repudiated the whole Bible, or as a Christian, uh, and apostatizing, you repudiate every teaching there is in the New Testament, uh, that really you're not apostate. And if it comes to loosing where God hasn't loosed, then they think if you haven't loosed everybody from every obligation, the authority of Christ in the New Testament lays upon them, then you're not liberal. That's not true. Let's take a case from the New Testament. Let's go into the last few verses, and the first few verses, or the last few verses of chapter 14 of Acts, first few verses, in fact, the whole chapter of chapter 15. And let's keep in mind what is said in Galatians 1 and 2. There will be some references made by Paul back to what happened there in Antioch of Syria in the latter verses of chapter 14 and most of chapter 15 of Acts. The Judaizing teacher was a Jew who fully believed in Christ, obeyed the gospel, and was a member of the church. But why is the term Judaizing teacher such a derogatory term? Because when the Gentiles, when it became obvious that God had willed that the Gentiles could be saved by the same gospel the Jews believed and obeyed, there rose up certain, that we learn from Acts 15, of the Pharisees who believed, which means that those of the Pharisees who heard and obeyed the gospel, that if you're a Gentile, you still must be circumcised to keep the law or Jesus can't save you. Now, of course, that's binding where God didn't bind. So they came from Jerusalem down to Antioch and began to teach that doctrine. And you will find rather quickly that Paul and Barnabas being there and Paul being an apostle fully knowing exactly what the gospel was and what it wasn't, being the apostle to the Gentiles, had never taught any such thing. And immediately they took issue with that person or those persons who taught that you can be saved by Christ 
But here's the full plan of salvation for you Gentiles. Hear the gospel. Be persuaded by it that Christ is the Son of God. Therefore, fully believe that He's the Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God. And then you are qualified to be baptized for the remission of your sins. But don't stop there. You Gentiles had to be circumcised to keep the law. Now you're acceptable to Christ. Paul rose up immediately and dealt with that matter. And here is what he refers to about that in uh, the book of Galatians. He says in Galatians uh, chapter 2, concerning these false teachers, in verse number 5, as to the action of Paul and Barnabas in dealing with them, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Why, Paul? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. When false doctrine is taught, it's poison in the spiritual system of the Lord, and the antidote must be given immediately. When you know a thing is sin, and there's no doubt about it, and it has invaded the spiritual body of Christ, you deal with it according to the example of the Apostle Paul. And can you find a better example? Notice his attitude toward them in verse 6. Those who taught the false doctrine. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. I'm an apostle of Christ. And Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, gives me everything I need to know and I don't need to go meet with anybody. He is in the position of all apostles of Jesus Christ. He knows what's right. He didn't have to wait till they got down and discussed all that matter in Jerusalem, Acts 15, before he stood up for the truth and exposed error. He's already in a great dissension with him as soon as he heard the false doctrine in the church at Antioch. Just read it there. They had a pretty heated ramrod effect there because error destroys. The only enemy you've got ultimately is sin. Sin's like a cancer. How much of it do you want in you? Should you wait till it's eating your head off and then say, think I'll do something about this? Well, you won't be thinking too much if it gets that far along in your head. Notice, he goes on down here and specifies dealing with brethren. And look who these brethren are. Who had played the hypocrite. And that's what dissimulation means in Elizabethan English, the King James Version. And this is what he said. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood into the face because he was to be blamed. Blamed for what? For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separating himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled, played the hypocrite with him. Likewise, insomuch at Barnabas, who's called when we were first introduced to him, son of consolation also was carried away with their hypocrisy, their dissimulation. Now watch what he said. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, this is a public matter, folks, be for them all. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? They're still trying to iron out in their mind what it is to be a Christian under the New Testament of Christ, that all men approach God through the New Testament of Christ. Now the point being made here, when Paul saw the error that was taught by the Judaizing teachers, when it first reared its ugly head in the Lord's church in Antioch, he took issue with them right then. Didn't wait an hour. When Peter comes to Antioch, a fellow apostle guided by the Holy Spirit just as he was, 
Peter did not live up to the truth he had been given and revealed in Acts 10 and 11. For it was through Peter that it was made clear that the Gentiles, the uncircumcised Gentiles, have a right to salvation on the same basis, by the same rule, by the same gospel, God's power to save, that the Jew does. Now, when you put it all together, what does that say about dealing with any sin as soon as you know it's sin, and especially a public sin? What do you do? And if you're going to have a thus saith the Lord that he's going to like live by faith, act by faith, as Abel did, and as Abel is used as an example to teach us how to act in Hebrews 11, what are you going to do? Are we going to be like uh, a certain Roman who said, go thy way. I have more convenient season, I'll call on you. There is never a convenient season going to come. That convenient season, as soon as you know what's right, you do it. We seem to understand that with people outside of Christ who are lost in their alien sins. And so we urge them, obey the gospel today. You don't have maybe, I may never finish the next word. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Did you get that? Did it emphasize it? N O W now is the accepted time. Well, what about this afternoon? Now. Three words. Is there something wrong with that? Now is the accepted time to do what? Do what God said do in the way he said do it by the reason he said do it. Do we have an example to show us how to do that? Yes! <laughs> Are we without excuse if we don't do it? Yes! <laughs> Will we go to heaven if we operate that way? Listen, make it clear. No! What are we going to do about it? Repent! You won't forget this today, brethren. You just will not. You may not believe it. You may not like the way I said it. You will not forget it. And that's my job. That's my job. So to live by faith is to be sure you do what the Bible authorizes. And when is it time to do that? Now. I'm not trying to be just facetious. I'm doing something to make a point. I know something about public speaking. I know something about driving home a point that seems to be overlooked sometimes. And I've driven that just about as hard as I know how to drive it. <laughs> so if you're not a Christian, today's the day to do it. But not just today. Now. That you can be a person who lives by faith as the Bible sets out the totality and the information of what it is to do. There's a sense of urgency. Brethren, if you're, if you're a sinner, don't you know if you die now, you're lost? If that's not what preaching and teaching and serving God's all about, to be saved, will you tell me what we're supposed to do? Why have I spent 47 years preaching? I could have been out there doing like a lot of other folks. But I am thankful to God Almighty that a long time ago I chose the better way and I've never regretted it. A lot of hardship. <laughs> but not near as much when I look at those in the Bible. Why, what I face pales into insignificance when it comes to what they face. And I'm too far down the road. I can almost see the door into glory. I'm not going to quit. He's never done anything but take care of me through thick and thin. And he never will if by faith I serve him until he calls me home or the Lord comes back first. We study what to do to become a Christian. If you're not, we hope you will. If as a child of God you've sinned, you know you've sinned, you've brought reproach on yourself, on the church, on the gospel, why be stubborn and full of pride 
and keep on in sin. You'll be lost. Humble yourself on the mighty hand of God. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Repent of your sins. Come confessing that we'll pray with you and for you. And the great God of glory will forgive you. And once again, we can all go in scriptural fellowship right down to the day that we depart this life. And we'll lay our armor down, so battered and scarred it very well may be. And we can breathe a great sigh of relief because we fought the good fight. We've kept the faith. Therefore, there's laid up for us a crown of righteousness. And not to me only, Paul says, but to all those that love his appearing. If you're subject to the great call of our Lord, through the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.